we've known each other for almost four years now, Philip. And now we finally talk about how you did your career, uh, how maybe what decisions you did to reach this level, but, and, and we will get there uh, in a second, but uh, maybe I want to kick it off uh, with my very first question, which is dealing with um, startups. So when you think about startups, what in your opinion is, you know, something that, um, uh, that, that is crucial to identifying high potential startups in the end um also because we are dealing with a very very rapidly growing uh, industry right which which is the blockchain industry so uh, when you look at all these deals coming in uh, in such a speed how do you grasp what is high potential and what is not high potential yeah i i'm, I'm trying to, uh, to 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 i'm trying to get an opinion on various startups which i'm getting to know you know people send me pitch decks i meet them at conferences and i'm I'm very interested in what people are doing just uh, because startups are those innovations uh, where we will talk about in one year, in two years, in three years. So when you have a looks at uh, like a good look at startups, you can see what happens in the future because some of the startups are trying to build things which might be needed in one, two, three, four, five years, right? And therefore, I'm very curious and I'm very happy to talk to all these startups. Um, but of course, you know, time is scarce. Therefore, you have to form a quick opinion on each startup, whether this might be interesting or not, whether it's worth it uh, to, to spend a lot of time uh, investigating their pitch deck or talking to them or meeting uh, them or not, right? So what is important? So first of all, I think um, from a blockchain perspective, you have so many domains going on, as I have said previously, Web3, NFT, carbon trading. Then with the new regulation coming up in Europe, for example, the Mika regulation, which is very interesting coming to us next year, everything around digital asset uh, will grow um, because this, the government is now allowing this and created licenses for this. Then we have Bitcoin and digital securities and this and that. So many, many, many topics. So you have to identify what topics are, how mature and which topics will mature in the future. Now let's make some examples. So the custody business, for example, companies providing custody solutions, this has already matured significantly, so it does make sense to found yet another company in the custody business. Then uh, there are uh, exchanges out there. Um, exchanges are Binance and, and the like. In my mind, this cluster of companies is also quite mature. It doesn't make so much sense um, to, to found yet another exchange. You can still found a, a custody company and an exchange if you wish. Everybody has to decide this for himself. But from a likelihood perspective, it's just more difficult than 10 years ago or five years ago. Then we have, for example, the on-chain analytics domain, which is still interesting, but we also see that the on-chain analytics domain is already maturing. Um, that's companies like Tune Analytics. That's also the entire cluster of AML analytics companies. So there are still rooms to explore this, but you would have to be very fast. And then there are other domains, just to make some examples. So for example, carbon tokenization, which has not yet been discovered by the general public. Um, so this is still a very good field to get started in because it's still very early and um, and, the, and there have not been any huge companies arising yet, but this will come in maybe six months, I would say so. NFTs, I don't believe in them so much unless you put them into the metaverse. Um, the metaverse is largely existing on paper. You have, we have some of the platforms such as Decentraland and Sandbox. So you can see here how this might be looking in the future, but also here, much of the developments have to be done in the future. So Metaverse with all its facets should also be a very interesting domain, including mapping uh, objects into the Metaverse, you know, scanning them, putting them in 3D rendering format and so on and so forth, endless opportunities there. Um, privacy is a topic which will come up in the future. So to summarize, I think it's key to understand, to try to make sense out of these sub hypes which are going on and try to identify what hypes are already matured, which are currently on the rise and which are so small and can potentially arise in the future. I think this is very important. And second, I think the founders, as always, have to be the right ones. It needs to be the best team is, in my personal opinion, you know, like the really ideal team is um, is a team where you have an, a tech guy who can do the programming part, who can do the design part, um, but who actually can do programming to some degree. Um, he would then later on be the CTO and delegate and coordinate all technical things. And then a second founder um, should then be the CEO type of guy 
and he is responsible to manage the entire project, but to primarily do um, marketing, sales, talking to customers, try to identify the true product, specify the product and make the product such that somebody wants to pay for this in the future, right? This is the CEO task, right? That means in case you have a startup where there is nobody doing the marketing part or nobody doing the sales part because the CEO is just doing project management, then I would, uh, I would, for example, assume that there is one of the key parts missing in the startup, which is the outreach part, right? So that's basically the individual uh, topic around founders. Then um, when we talk about blockchain, very often it's relevant from a regulatory perspective. We are dealing with money very often. So governments have installed their regulation, which we have to comply with. So you can easily say you are creating a new bank, but doing this and creating this takes you years and costs you millions. So yes, you can say it, but the likelihood is quite low that it will actually work out. And therefore, the intensity of regulatory burdenness, I think, needs to be inspected very well. You can do lightweight business models such as analytics or education things uh, where regulatory stuff is not relevant. So you can grow more easily there, more speedily, but you can also try to form a custodian or a crypto exchange uh, where then the regulatory stuff is very, very hard. So the regulatory dimension is very important and uh, it, it brings speed down in case it's regulatorily too intense and it increases costs dramatically. Then next domain I would like uh, to look at is the, the, uh, the, the degree of internationality. And I think it doesn't make sense to just look at business models which might work in Germany. Um, it makes more sense to look at business models uh, which at least cover um, the entire European market that could be MECA regulated business models or even more so um, business models where you can tackle the entire worldwide market. I think we have to understand that a market is not traditional like Germany where people would consume specific services regardless of their age. Crypto is different. Crypto is more like orthogonal uh, to this. You have a specific segment in the society, people between 20 and 45 um, who are very interested in this stuff, but it doesn't matter where they are. They can be in Singapore, in Germany, in France, in Argentina, and they could all be your customers in this worldwide ecosystem because crypto is so international as nothing else previously. So this degree uh, for is very important because it allows a company to potentially grow and find customers somewhere on the planet. And may maybe one more point, sorry for talking so long, Max, but one more point. Um, would be the um, the um, how would I call it? Also, we, which topics did we have? The maturity of the underlying area, then the team CEO and uh, the CTO. Then we talked about the regulatory intensity. And we talked about the international topic. And the last point I would like to mention is basically: is it B two C or is it B two B? Companies are not good at adopting blockchain technology. Think of Siemens, Bosch, Daimler, and all these companies. They haven't done many pro pro blockchain projects which are successful. Rather, the entire dynamic we are, which we are seeing, be it Bitcoin or the metaverse, is driven by retail people. So in case you are a company which is servicing companies, then it might be much difficulter when you compare it to a company serving servicing individuals with their retail decisions, right? So from a tendency, um, I would rather go with uh, companies servicing retail because B2B and blockchain does not go hand in hand together easily. Some exceptions are those companies who are at least customer fronting, that's NFT stuff, for example, companies issuing NFT, this works, but only because the consumer of NFT is a retail person, otherwise it would not work, or um, carbon tokenization, CO2 offsetting, this is also for the companies, but immediately you see here very long sales cycles of uh, nine to 12 months. So you see here, you can be much more speedily in case you are addressing the retail market. So these are, I think, the five dimensions I would uh, recommend um, to look at. And with this, they are also, in my mind, counterintuitive, because if you would compare this with the Web2 realm, right, at that point of time, it was very easy to set up an online shop, create some goods, and just sell it and ship it via DHL to people in Germany. And here, younger founders 
have been very good at you know setting up online shops you didn't necessarily require uh, the regulatory knowledge uh, where we where people are very often than 40 plus also doing shipping is more something which can be done locally in germany because of the logistics providers um, it's done by as i said younger people regulatory stuff doesn't play a role and the international component in the beginning might not also play a role because um, logistics for example in e-commerce are local so with this you can easily see that the dimensions of how i would recommend viewing web3 companies are in my mind very very strongly different um, when you compare it to web2 e-commerce topics minus 15 years ago the only key point which is this which is exactly the same one is the quality of the founder team that's as i said the tech guy and the marketing sales management guy I actually I, I love I, I love the summary because you see it so often um where there are brilliant teams uh, brilliant um tech guys and they build a product and then they uh, and then we ask them as investors you know how many users do you have and uh they say you know if we build a good product users will come to us but uh, ladies and gentlemen, it doesn't work like this. So uh, if you don't do marketing and you don't do our outreach actively, then nobody will know about you. That's the harsh reality. So then you are founders, a research organization. Yeah. Then you are then you are a research organization, but you're not a company. Exactly. So uh, I think this is something that everyone has to remember, um, startups and investors alike. Pay special attention to um, startups that actually do outreach and you know uh, as investors ourselves we have we invest in over 20 startup 15 15 to 20 startups a year and the ones that perform best and are most su successful they have understood this um very simple principle which is doing outreach 24 7 like every day they reach out and think about uh, tactics to grow their audience uh, more and more so uh thanks philip for the um for the uh, for the introduction and the summary right of, of all the verticals um when you see a lot of deals uh, and information nowadays is, is like overflowing everywhere um how do you manage um the influx of 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 deals of information how do you manage it and how do you um sort them and then make a, a thorough decision yeah that's, this is very difficult because it's uh the workload with com with incoming um communication is is increasing day by day and Yes, we all could work with assistants who are trying to sort this out for us, but sometimes I think um, assistants don't have the context knowledge, so they would miss out on specific um, information. Yeah, For example, I have gotten an invitation to a conference of the Istanbul, also from the Turkish Blockchain Association. And from my perspective, you know, this is my cultural background, this email didn't look perfectly form formatted, right? So if I were my own assistant, I would have sorted out this email as an crazy inquiry from some crazy people on the planet but I looked at the email and I now understand that people in other cultures write emails partly different you know for whatever reasons that's how it is and therefore I uh, I see I just answered this question if um, um if if they are interested in speakers and I can also recommend uh, some other speakers and then I saw that this is a real inquiry and it's the largest crypto conference in Istanbul it's not a random crazy stuff um, but it's a large-scale crypto conference but I was biased by my own cultural background viewing their email um, somehow strangely right but just by replying to them giving them a chance understanding what's going on here I, I saw that this is an amazing conference and I proposed to them a couple of people which I could invite at least from from a German uh, startup uh, ecosystem right and actually they now did invite two three startups from Germany and they are even paying the travel costs right but would you have expected this no would the assistant have sorted out this email most probably yes so therefore it's very 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 difficult to manage this because once you rely on an assistant uh, for for managing the inbound of um, communication at that point of time you you are partly biased by other people and you uh, people don't reach you directly anymore therefore I personally like direct communication like email whatsapp um, and also linkedin but it's increasingly difficult to manage uh, all this stuff uh, which is going on so what are tricks what you can do here i think um some some tricks you know just just some 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 hacks 
which I which work best for myself. Uh, but maybe Max would also be nice to hear your opinion on your uh, hacks and tricks. What I do is I try to reply briefly on emails. I avoid writing lengthy emails because it costs me time and it costs the other person endless time to read it. And uh, and I also know that long emails are very often not read. Right? So I try to keep it very, very brief when I reply. Then once I look at an email, I try to reply immediately if possible, because then I have to touch this email only once and not twice. Um, also, I try to avoid, if possible, answering within a couple of minutes or seconds, because if the other person is doing this um, also, then you end up in this ping pong, you know, which keeps you busy for half an hour. So sometimes it makes sense to uh, answer emails only with a delay of 6 to 12 or even 24 hours. Uh, such that this high frequency ping pong between people uh, doesn't occur, right? Uh, it keeps you busy. Then, um, for example, with social media, in case uh, this is also some sort of inbound, in case you are posting something and in case people are then replying their feedback, then I'm very selective on engaging in discussions because with in uh, discussions on Twitter and in social media, you also engage in endless discussions, which you cannot win. You might not be able to convince people. That's also not my mission um but you lo you lose a lot of time with with meaningless uh, discussions so i'm i'm just selective there i'm not saying that i'm not doing it but i'm just selective there then i'm uh, if um we are trying to collaborate with good people at the university bfg has excellent people uh, we work a lot with uh, email templates you know very often you have the same stuff we are not lawyers you know where each email is an individual uh, email so it makes very much sense to try to work with um email templates which you can reuse i use the software which is called spark which adds on top of the google email server and the spark software on apple mac at least um, can digest very nicely all these um, uh, email templates uh, so, so once you discover patterns of email communication put them in a template you know that saves a lot of time what else can you do it's it's nice to receive emails because then you can at least research them afterwards even in half a year i can go back in time and analyze uh, who has said what at what point of time but for this it's also sufficient to simply be cc now i don't need to write each email myself it's okay if other people write the email but um, sometimes i'm happy to be on cc to at least have the paper trail in my um, email inbox right what else can I have as a good trick? Um, WhatsApp is nice, but it also starts to be very busy with people uh, sending many, many WhatsApps. But still, I think WhatsApp is good to um, to briefly do chatting and coordinating things with close contacts, right? With close contacts, but with people who are not so close, yeah, like uh, maybe another organization, people who I have not been dealing with. Um, that's where email is better. And therefore, very often I give priority to uh, to WhatsApp to basically um, when if in, in case I'm the bottleneck, I'm try to solve it by answering WhatsApp very quickly, such that the bottleneck is not me anymore. And in case then time is left, then I start with the emails. This works best, as I've said. Don't answer right away. In case you touch emails, um, touch them just one, not multiple times if possible. Um, answer briefly to save time, right? But still, don't disregard communication, right? The communication, doing it properly is so, so, so important, especially when people are working remotely all across the world and communication and try to get the perspective of um, of the other person in case I'm sending out this and that. Will it work? You know, did I really delegate the task or did I just create more questions on the other side? Huh? So try to imagine on the other side where you're sending this email to is this email really helpful or does it just creates chaos complexity and questions right um this is something you can do with each email you are replying to and then uh, what else can we do i'm i'm not jumping on calls right away i first try to uh, to have a look at uh, at things via email for example i'm not jumping on calls directly with a startup first i would like to uh, to see some written material like a pitch deck because from the written material from the pitch deck you can infer whether the company is legit, whether the founders are doing a good job. And if they are not doing such a good job, then it would be a waste of time um, entering a call with them because the day just has 24 hours, right? You can't work more. And um, that's some of the heuristics, some of the tactics I, yeah. I do yeah. to, to manage this huge workload. Max, what about you? 
thank you <laughs> about me um so, so first of all a lot of what you said is uh i also do right uh, using shortcuts using templates um when i re receive pitch decks i put them in my notion board which is like structured into have seen is qualified should schedule a call so like i, I structure it very well so that um i don't lose time uh, and also, as you said, uh, the, the day only has 24 hours and a few hours we have to sleep. So uh, I also don't take on calls immediately. And I have to admit, every time I took on a call immediately based on a title, based on uh, maybe the first few keywords in, in the outreach email, I always regretted it because it never led to anything. Whereas when I precisely asked about the context, uh, was way better calls. So uh, you, people can save a lot of time by just simply asking for more yeah, material. But, but Max, Max, we all have these, we all have to take these calls in the beginning to have exactly this learning and to calibrate ourselves uh, to uh, to force us to ask the right questions to then subsequently have a, a better improved call, right? So without, without making these bad experiences, you wouldn't be able to now um, learn from it and embody it in your daily routine. So therefore, I'm happy with doing lots of the stuff myself, even though it doesn't work always, because this way we all are learning and then can embody all this in the next uh, cycle. Yeah. True, true. Um, okay. And uh, and so, <laughs> truthfully, how long do you spend uh, on on you know screening uh, a pitch deck that you get um, out of the blue, like a cold outreach? They send you a pitch deck. Uh, how long do you need until you know, okay, this is qualified or this is not qualified? Mm, you get at, at some point of time, you get a feeling quite nicely. You get uh, you get a good feeling um, when you have maybe five to 10 minutes to look at the pitch deck, then you get a feeling whether this could make potentially sense. And by the way, the email where the where this PDF is attached uh, also uh, is, is very important. You know, how is the CEO writing emails? Uh, is this basically including all information? Is this just, you know, like... Uh, a random email one liner uh, so to say um, or is the is is the ceo the ceo creating a little bit of effort to make me understand what he wants right um this is uh, this is also like a very important context information and then once you have created like a first opinion about a pitch deck then it's time to decide whether um whether um whether you whether you would like to proceed and then it makes sense to answer some questions. You know, what is the valuation? Um, what is the state of the product? What are the costs and so on? And then see what the people are replying. And um, it's interesting that some people reply this information. And I think that's that's the best approach. Other people are just chatting and creating some text, but not answering correctly. This is not good. And uh, even more other people are then still just insisting on joining a call, but they are not directly answering to the question. And um, I think it's everybody is different here, but I would always prefer to have two, three, four questions answered because it also checks for the capability of the founder to be able to answer uh, questions and understand what I'm uh, interested in, right? And uh, and depending on the way of communication and the style of communication, I think then it makes sense to jump on a call, say half an hour, and um, get to know each other, understand uh, more about the company, and then dive into detail what's going on there. And if this is then interesting, I think then is coming the, the most interesting point. If logistically possible, it makes sense to meet uh, these people uh, for a coffee, for a beer, because it's very often then good people, interesting people, and you can understand what is the goal of the startup, but you also get an understanding about um, what type of person uh, is this? And it's also nice to 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 invest time into nice chats with good people um, over a coffee. You just can't do this day by day because time is not there. Um, but what I just described is basically a very easy to maintain funnel based on the right questions and not just accepting the paper dressed, the window dressed material which is being sent to you, but also uh, considering the context around this what is the communication exactly looking like? How is this person uh, responding? Is it responding briefly or in all kinds of lengths? Is it responding within one or two days or does it take two weeks to respond? You know, this, this is all stuff which is then impacting the opinion. Thank you. Um, yeah, very interesting. And um, when you 
I mean, obviously, you have a few years of experience already during your career. You worked as an entrepreneur. Um, you built the Frankfurt School Blockchain Center. Now, um, throughout that path, that journey, what do you think are um, certain decisions that you made on the way, on the go, that got to where you are right now? So what do you think, uh, or maybe what did you regret uh, not doing or doing uh, that got you here? Yeah, yeah, an interesting question. So, you know, first of all, the, the, the Frankfurt School Blockchain Center is 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 not a true entrepreneurial um, uh, occupation. It's it's just an, an institute or a department with it within the university, right? But still, we had to invent uh, new types of education to educate blockchain. That's, for example, called Web3 Talents. Or we're also running a conference, um, which is quite interestingly done from an from a conference perspective, so it involves some entrepreneurship aspects. Otherwise, we, we we wouldn't have been able to build a blockchain center, but still it's a department at the university. But prior to this, indeed, I have founded uh, two, three companies before I came to the university. And um, what are key learnings here? I think, I think maybe two, three points. I think you cannot underestimate how important it is to do outreach. Outreach uh, on LinkedIn, on Twitter, in real life, going to conferences, meeting people, meeting them for a beer, meeting them for a coffee, meeting them for lunch, uh, outreach, outreach, outreach in all kinds of direction, right? Um, yes, you have to care about your time. Um, some of the stuff costs a lot of time, but without outreach, you cannot build a network and a network is so important for, uh, for your future career in a specific field. And the network is being built by outreach, by contacting people and so on and so forth. And with this, this is directly related to proactiveness. In case you want to get something done, then you want to have it done, right? So it's my task to then make it happen. I write this email. I'm not waiting for anybody to do things. I'm I'm taking the initiative. Um, that's the proactiveness, which is in my mind urgently required because in case I'm not proactive, I would just sit there and wait until things happen. And then I could wait forever, right? So proactiveness is important. Um, and also a little bit of personal branding is important. Social media like LinkedIn gives to all of us in the hands very interesting uh, instruments uh, where, um, where you can now communicate to people out there. And in case you do this nicely, constantly with good content, um, then uh, people will recognize it at some point of time. And this will then also create like a virtual network in, in LinkedIn and some people knowing you. And in case people would leave their employer going somewhere else, then this is the network being like a physical network or being it like an electronic network on LinkedIn. You can take such a network with you for the next 20 years when you move to other employers and so on. And this has always been like this. And uh, for this, for example, I would also criticize law firms because law firms are very often encouraging their, um, their young lawyers to not be on social media such that they... Uh, such that they uh, would also, also not be able to create an own network, right? And this would then um, at, at some point of time adversely affecting their careers because you have to have a network at some point of time. The other career path is being a technician and being an expert in technology. I think then you don't have to emphasize outreach that much, but uh, without being an expert in a specific IT domain, Python, whatever, um, I think outreach is something which cannot be underestimated. And therefore, I'm happy that I discovered uh, this, the importance of outreach at some point of time. And I am also this happy that I discovered LinkedIn and using it, it frequently. And um, therefore, this, this is something I think I would do again. Um, um, like this proactiveness is something you have to learn over time. I, um, I don't regret it in any way, but it would have been nicer to, to have learned this proactiveness couple of years earlier um, but this is something uh, which which you which you can't change anyway but it's important to learn all these things as early as possible right what else can I say here um yeah as a, of doing communication right trying to trying to assess what is the perspective of the other person receiving uh, the email you know is he then able to do the task or not communication delegation strict management, structuring of tasks, as you have said, Max, right? Outreach, proactiveness, I think this is all very, very important. And this is something where I think I would do it again uh, in the in the same in the same way. It's it's interesting that you said 
you when you write emails you are pushing things forward um because we see it so often especially um when when i sometimes you know i have a test uh, when i send people that want to work with me or with the firm i would ask them you know let's write an article or let's write an announcement together a partnership announcement uh you know a funding announcement whatever it is um i would ask them and then i would ask them and if i leave it i can guarantee nothing will happen Exactly. nothing will happen because nobody's pushing exactly. but the Nobody. moment i push it forward then it gets done and yeah. i think um, this is something uh, all, i guess all founders have to note down um you are responsible for for pushing things forward and you're the only one um owning the whole you know the, the success basically exactly. you have and to push things forward it, if you don't do it it will not happen and therefore, I do write that email because I want to get this done right. In case I don't write this email, then nothing happens. Right? That's exactly what you mentioned, uh, Max. Very nice. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Very interesting. And uh, now let's uh, let, let's say you, you um, or, or you know personally, I would love to engage with uh, Angel Investments this year uh, and maybe next year and and all the years following that. Um, if if you had an advice for smaller investors, angel investors, small ticket investors, um, what would be sort of your go-to advice to navigate um, the early stages or the first uh, days of, of being a, becoming an investor? Yeah, yeah, that's also a good question. What would I recommend? I think it's important to um, to understand a specific domain, in this case, Web3, we talked about it. It's important to understand um, how people are. That's the topic around outreach, communication. You, you need to create an image of the world uh, here to not be erratic, but to have it in a systematic way. And um, another point, which I did not mention so far, is I think you always have to have multiple alternatives, right? It's, it's very interesting to look at one startup, but you can only judge or assess specific startups when you have uh, three other uh, startups at hand such that you can compare what might be the best uh, decision uh, to to invest in case you are left with only one startup then the probability might be high that you are investing uh, but the, the the but you didn't see the entire breadth of what's what's possible out there right um one point is also the the um the 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 the, uh, the, the multiple the, the multiple effect on the potential gain in valuation, but also across the time span, right? So what do you want to have? Ideally, you would like to have the shortest time frame and the highest uh, valuation, right? This is what you have, what you have maximum multiple in the shortest uh, time frame. And what you do not want to have like, is an endless time frame over years, and then uh, only a multiple of say 5x. This is what you not want to have. And trying to map, uh, business chances or startup chances in uh, in these two uh, metrics makes also much sense um, be because this is what you would like to optimize and then the question is for example would you rather invest in an would you rather invest in an in an in a, in a startup which where the valuation is 40 million or where the valuation is 4 million yeah it depends right from 40 million to 400 million valuation times 10 um, that's a tough game in case you would like to build a 400 million valued uh, company you know this company is having a lot of revenue a lot of employees a lot of structures and it will take years to build it right um from 400 from 40 to 400 is 10x and you saw here a 400 million company is a lot of work from 4 to 40 is also 10 million uh, is also 10 times 10x um but potentially it could go a little bit faster because um with because of 40 million companies might only have um a couple of million revenue for example not necessarily dozens of million right this could be easier achievable especially when you have a high dynamic mark regulation intensity is low and uh, in in, uh customers might even be international right so therefore um putting putting this all in a in a box you know like the the absolute amount of the absolute amount of valuation which is directly connected to the multiple and then putting this into perspective with the time frame you potentially could achieve this putting this together um i think that makes a very nice information or a very nice uh, trigger point to then decide 
how long does it take for the company to get the multiple? How high is the valuation already? Will it increase or not? I make a very naive uh, example here, and then you will understand immediately what I mean. Would you invest in the company called Facebook Meta right now? Would you invest or not? Uh, that's the point, you know. The question is you would only invest in this company when you expect a multiple in terms of growth, which is rooted in revenue growth. Will the revenue growth of um, Facebook and Meta increase? Not necessarily, right? Just renaming the company to uh, to Meta doesn't solve the problem that social medias uh, start to function differently. And we also see Metaverse is coming up from the decentral uh, domain. So the, the decision to go into the Metaverse might not work out on the long run, leading to a high multiple. So um, it might even um, look like that, uh, that the stock price would be flat or would even decrease. Right? You don't know. So what, why is this? Because the valuation of Facebook is already so high, you know, like billions. The valuation is so high that it might be difficult to create yet another high multiple with the current situation. Um, and if the high multiple would be there, then it would take a hell lot of time. Therefore, this would be an example where you should be skeptical. Why is Facebook still better than uh, many other startups? Because at least you have it in a liquid stock, yeah, you can decide to divest and get the money back, right? This is what you can do with uh, startups, but what you uh, with with stock market with the companies, but what you cannot do uh, with startups, right? With startups, the money probably is locked in at least for at least for two, three, four years, I would guess so. And in case the metrics don't really fit, then the money is locked in for eight years or nine years. Yeah, that's something you just have to expect. Yeah. So uh, as as everyone can see. It's a lot of uh, a lot of factors, a lot of verticals. Um, I have two more follow-on questions to this. So again, I would love uh, to start angel investing this year, maybe next year. Um, I have an advantage because I work in the VC industry. But uh, to everyone out there who might be interested, um, what is the best way to get into these early stage, interesting, high return deals? And what do you think is the minimum ticket size that somebody has to have in, in order to get in? Yeah, difficult. Um, I think that's exactly the same stuff as we, talk, we talked about previously. It's about the outreach topic and around the communication uh, topic. In case you would like to invest money and in case you're not talking to anybody, then you will never, ever invest money. So you have to uh, create outreach. You have to sit down with people. You have to ask people to whom else you should talk. You have to be flexible. You uh, You shouldn't care about just one nation, in this case Germans, I, I should not just talk to people in Germany, I should be open, talk to people uh, everywhere on the planet. Um, I need to manage my time wisely, but I have to do outreach on this regard as well, uh, talking to people, meeting them, and then trying to put it into some kind of uh, framework to, to see uh, with whom does it make sense to to explore further relationships, because this person might have access to good deals, right? Um, I think that's it's communication and outreach. Uh, I don't believe so much in in nice platforms like Crunchbase out there because once a deal or a startup is already there, then it's already on the market, right? Ideally, you would like to get access to off-market startups. It's like with real estate. Once a real estate object is listed in all kinds of platforms, then apparently it didn't sell in the off-market, right? So, um, so therefore, and how is the off-market is by definition not systematic. So you have to make it systematic for yourself and you have to um, approach this situation with uh, communication and outreach. There is no other chance. Outreach can also be going to conferences, meeting to people and so on and so forth. What is the minimum ticket size? Um, I think 25,000 maybe. I think that, that could be, also if possible, 50,000, but uh, you could also split this up in two times uh, 25,000 and diversify your risk. So therefore, maybe 25,000 is a good number. 10,000 um, is also nice, but but you always have the, the burden from legal perspective. You know, you have to sign documents, you have to go to the notary, you have to do all kinds of documents. So with 10,000, the the administrative costs uh, for both sides, by the way, uh, to process all this um, make, might make it inefficient. Yeah? Therefore, maybe, but you can have multiple opinions here, right? I would I would go for 25 as a minimum. Perfect. Um, okay, thank you, Philip. We are nearing the end of this uh, chat. Uh, I was great uh, hosting you. Uh, a, a lot of new things I learned about you. 
Um, thanks for your insights. Uh, I have a last uh, outro, which is uh, basically any list, any audience, any listener here um, who wants me to talk uh, to maybe another person, we will do this fireside chat every month. And if you liked it, if you like the style, if you like the casualness, then feel free to reach out to me. Uh, if you have questions to Philip, I guess Philip will be reachable through LinkedIn. His LinkedIn is also linked uh, in the description box down below. And um, again, if you have anyone who I should talk to, please feel free to contact me and send me the name. I'll reach out and then uh, we will do this next month again. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Thanks, Philip, for your time and hopefully seeing you soon again. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks for the good questions. Goodbye. Thank you. <laughs>